Activities on Women on the Bench. You've read that. And this is a project on female judges in five fragile states. The states being Angola, Uganda, from Africa, Guatemala, Haiti, and then Afghanistan. We just had a session on this, Afghanistan, heard a lot about it. But in our context, of course, we are interested in still different pieces of uh, information. So um, in the order, we have our nice colleagues here um, for, uh, from the Center of Law and Social Transformation. Um, Angola is dealt with by Erling, um, together with Aslak Ora, I heard. I don't know whether <laughs> he, she is here. No. <laughs> so I just present those who are here. Um, they have co-authors, co and you can speak about your co-authors. Uh, Uganda is dealt with by Siri Glocken, and Afghanistan by Torun Wimpelman, you have met already, and Haiti by Marianne Torasi. I'm Ulrike Schulz from Germany, and I'm specialized on well, one specialization. It is on questions of the legal profession, women in the legal profession, and gender law. And this is how I came into this project. Let me give a brief general introduction into the subject. So why is it important to do research on women in law? We have a brief history, short history of only 120 years of women in law. Um, in former times, if we take the Western world, that was a, we have a society of men. And when it was discovered that people should have individual rights, individual rights were for men. So the French constitution, the first constitution giving individual rights, uh, had brotherhood, fraternity, but the sisters were not included. And all the um, constitutions of 19th century societies and states were for men and men's rights and not women. So women had a problem to get access to higher education, university education, um, and only at the turn from the 19th to the 20th century, they by and by fought their way into uh, legal education. And then um, it was by no means easy for them to be admitted to the legal profession. Again, uh, quite a lot of uh, fighting uh, was needed. What was the problem? We, women were considered to have a gendered character. And the worst <laughs> professions <laughs> were where uh, the gendered character was discussed were, were the old professions, medicine and law. And in law, they said objectivity matters. The judge has to be objective and neutral, but women are moody and emotional and can't pass, pass just decisions. So that was a, a big problem, problem. But of course, there were others who said, oh, these nice women are too soft for hard legal work. And uh, women were competitors in the field. So the first admissions to the legal profession basically were between 1920 and 19. 30, so we have a history of 100 years. This is in general about women in law. Now, women judges, and this subject is even more important than the general issue of women in law, because women judges represent the state. They have a public office, a part of the state power. And so it made in many countries the situation for women to even more difficult to get into uh, judicial office. They needed full citizenship, the right to vote. So admission was connected to the right to vote. In Germany, they got it in 1919, after the First World War. But in France, for example, only in 1946, um, in Italy in the 60s, in Portugal in 1978. Um, the amazing thing about that is that just these countries I have mentioned are those where women judges uh, soon became a majority of judges. This, uh, <laughs> I cannot explain this effect. That's really amazing. And uh, the story was further complicated. Once women had got the right to vote, this did not mean uh, that they had full legal status according to family law. So um, under family law, in many countries, we still had 
the problem uh, that the husband had the right over the children, the right to decide on the money in the family. The husband had to decide where the family could live and uh, could terminate uh, women's labor contracts. Uh, several other things uh, a little different from country to country. And this, for example, in Germany um, was a development till 1978. Uh, just to show you the timeline um, with which we are dealing. And of course, we have to put women in law and women judges in the general context of women in higher leading positions and how they fare there. And we have, of course, a political aim of giving an equal uh, share uh, to women in higher positions. And uh, in Germany, we had a funding line, women to the top from which I, <laughs> I got funding money. And just to give you one really, um, <laughs> really worrying um, statistical figure, in Germany, only 17% of women on chairs in legal faculties are women. And this is a figure of today, not of 20 years ago. Well, a little back in history, the growth in numbers, although we had uh, women admitted uh, to the legal profession, the bench uh, uh, till the, let's say, 1920s, um, uh, it, it took several decades until there was a considerable growth in numbers. Meanwhile, in many countries, women outnumber men in legal studies. So the majority of law students is uh, women. This much about women not being able to do serious legal work. And we have high numbers of, of female judges in civil law countries. In civil law countries, we have career judges, meaning um, once uh, young lawyers have a qualification sometime in their um, 20s, they can be uh, admitted to judicial office. This is different in common law countries where judges are admitted on marriage later on in their lives when they're experienced practitioners. And uh, so in, in common law countries, the numbers rose much slower. But we must be careful of talking about judges in common law countries because in common law, law countries, we have magistrates who deal with the minor cases uh, minor legal cases, and uh, the judges in civil law countries are something in between of combining uh, both. And then, of course, we have customary indigenous religious courts, which further complicates the picture. So you see, if we do these projects, these are about comparing, but comparing is difficult. We have differences in judicial systems. In the state structure, we have these very interesting information about uh, Afghanistan. Um, we have cultural issues and of course, post-colonial uh, effects we have uh, to keep in mind and which make a comp comparison difficult. But still there are similarities to discover and similarities often have to do um, with the position of lawyers in their society. I told you about <laughs> the, the civil and the family law status of uh, lawyers in uh, society. So we have quite a few publications on um, women um, in the judiciary. I've edited a big comprehensive international comparative book with 28 authors on 19 countries in 2000. Uh, 13 and their special issues um, on um, women, uh, women's access to the judiciary, on uh, gender education uh, for the judiciary, but we still have serious research gaps. So this is not a closed field, it's uh, ongoing and there's still a lot we have to deal with. So this is just to show you where this project comes in and uh, what the issues are, uh, which have to be uh, dealt with. And Ellen, may I ask you first to sum up the history of the project? I always think the history of a project is very interesting. Who, interesting, who has invented a, the project, applied for funding, <laughs> particularly as field work is implied, which uh, costs a lot of money. Okay, uh, I think the, the big, thank you Ulrike for the, for the great introduction and also for sort of placing our project uh, in a larger context. 
because I think the, the context itself was important for the motivation. Um, when we started the project or thinking about the project probably four or five years ago, um, there wasn't very much written about women judges in the South or in third world countries, uh, even less in fragile state contexts. So most of the literature was about women judges in the West, Western well-developed democracies with long-standing judiciaries, with legal traditions running 100, 200 years. Um, and most of the empirical evidence that we found was either based on the US or in Germany or in Canada. So very well-established democracies. So the question we had was, okay, does the world look similarly for women judges in different contexts? Um, and motivated by the literature, which is written about the female parliamentarians uh, in contexts of um, civil war and uh, fracture. I mean, one of the ideas is that if you have a country in conflict um, and you have breaking points in the history, this can create new opportunity structures for women. So since most, a lot of the literature focused on obstacles um, to entry, the entry, uh, entry to the bench, we were thinking, okay, well, these are two opposing claims, right? On the one hand, you claim that it's hard for women to get into judicial office because there are all these male gatekeepers, basically, who are entrenched in the system. Now, does this look differently when you have new judicial systems? So that was the motivation. Mm. I won't go into the funding much. Uh, I think this was a very much a collective effort. Uh, I mean, it's all the people on the stage here, but we also have people who are not sitting here mm. uh, who I would like to mention. Uh, we have Pilar Domingo at the ODI in London, who is central mm. in the Uganda study, mm -hmm. and also in conceptualizing the, the project. Uh, Rachel Cedar, who is in Mexico working for CSS, who's been a long-term uh, researcher and friend and uh, academic intellectual capacity at the CMI. Um, and then Aslak Orra, who is actually the only man on the project. No, two, oh, Antonio. Two. Antonio, of course, sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, Antonio, who works on Afghanistan uh, with Turun, and Aslak Orra, uh, both of them at the CMI, who works with me on Angola together with a local uh, partner in Angola, Nanga, and she has a very complicated long name. We call her Nanga. Uh, and uh, who else did I forget? Agnes Makiri is working with us. On yes, Angola. and on, no, on, uh, Uganda. on Uganda, and we have Anna on mm. uh, the, the Guatemala case. So basically, we have a bunch of about 15, 10, 15 researchers mm -hmm. uh, working on this project from different countries and, and backgrounds. Yes, and then we have you know, an expert group with uh, strong people helping us on the project, including Ruth, who was on the former panel with, uh, uh, with uh, Turun and yourself and a few other people. So why did we, you asked, why did we select these five countries? Uh, we had decided to focus on fragile states because we found nothing about women judges in fragile states when we started thinking about this. Uh, of course, there have been new publications and new projects uh, evolving since we started conceptualizing this. Uh, but we thought, okay, let's look at fragile states. So we decided to select five states, uh, from different legal traditions uh, and from different colonial backgrounds. Uh, so we have uh, the common law, Uganda. We have several civil law countries, one with a Portuguese heritage, Angola, uh, one with Spanish heritage, Guatemala, one with French heritage, which is Haiti. And then we have Afghanistan with Sharia law, which doesn't really have a colonial history influencing the, the, the legal system to the same extent as these other four colonial, former colon, colonial powers. So they're very, very different countries, uh, but we selected on two different dimensions. Um, one was the degree of fragility. So these are all fragile states, uh, but they vary in terms of how fragile they are and why they are fragile, because fragility is measured on different contexts in different dimensions. Violence is the degree of institutional, institutionalization are two of them. Uh, so, of course, you know, over the past two weeks, I think it has become very, very clear that uh, Haiti and Afghanistan are definitely mm. the most fragile uh, among the five countries. Uh, but the other countries have also suffered a long term violence, you know, the long 36 year long, um, very violent civil war in Guatemala. 
Uh, Angola had a bloody long-term civil war as well, and there's been internal armed conflict in Uganda, uh, with high casualties, internal displacement of, of refugees, institutions that have pretty much dissolved or been inoperative in long periods. So what does this do to being a woman judge? Right? This is the question. Is it possible to become a woman judge in these contexts? These five countries are also countries that are very poor, not necessarily on natural resources, but certainly in terms of average GDP. And access to education has been low in many of these countries, particularly for women. So the three countries, the three countries, the three questions we had uh, when we designed this project was, okay, so what are the factors influences influencing women's access to the bench? And we look at all courts at all levels. So courts at the first instance, but also media media level courts and the high courts. The second question we had coming out of the literature is what kind of experiences do women judges have once they get on the bench? Do they still face institutional or non-institutional obstacles? Can they climb in the system? Are they appointed to high offices? Are they only to be found in the lower courts? How does this work? Um, the third question we had was, does it make a difference? I don't think this is a question that we have been able to do uh, in terms of systematic case analysis. You know, we're not looking at the influence on decision making as such, but we have thought about what differences do women judges make in these different countries that they are operating in. Um, before we move on to the cases, let me also say that there is a huge variety among the five cases in the number of women judges in these five countries. And this is something that, you know, the, the people working on the cases can go into in more detail, but we have also selected on variety in, in uh, the percentage of women, Afghanistan and Haiti being very low, Angola being very high, Uganda being very high, and Guatemala being quite high, high. <laughs> yeah, so maybe I'll just stop there. Okay, so you wanted to give a little more on the case studies or, uh, okay. Not right now. No, no I no. think the okay. people working good, good, good. on the case studies just me. Do that. Yeah, let me just uh, stress one point, <laughs> one point of, which is really worrying me. Uh, the revolution and war always <laughs> is a, a phase in society <laughs> which has changed society enormously and helped women to get rights. It may also lead to a reversal of rights, what we experience in Afghanistan now. Mm. Um, yeah, and uh, you, you said in recent years, um, um, more publications on um, women in the judiciary have come out, yes. Um, let me just mention there are two countries without any woman judge uh, still in the world, and uh, this is Iran. They've had a woman judge before the revolution in 1980, but there's no woman judge left, and Saudi Arabia. But Saudi Arabia is on the way uh, to get a woman. A judge and interestingly, Palestine, which is one of the difficult, uh, fragile states too, has women judges. And there's quite a nice film on these women judges in Palestine. So if you're interested, I uh, can send you uh, the link uh, to it. Yes, and you've heard um, that we have <clears throat> to deal with uh, post colonial questions. Uh, but also in uh, countries, and I think Afghanistan is an example for it, we had a reception of foreign law. So it was not always that law was um, structure, even structure was forced onto countries, but we also had a process of reception that we were looking elsewhere. Um, well, these days it's mainly with constitutions that uh, receptions uh, are done. Uh, just to <laughs> highlight these points. Now I want to uh, catch up on your questions, Eli, you've mentioned. And now the questions go uh, to all of you. The first question is about access. So how did women get into the judiciary and why, when, who was, or when was the first one? How many are there today? Just uh, some uh, basic information. Uh, so, um, and maybe you could also say what made you, cho made you choose the country you are dealing with. We heard why you chose the range of countries, but of course you must be in a sense familiar um, with the situation in the countries. I don't think that you started from scrap dealing with these countries. So, Siri, I would like to start with you. 
Thank you, and thank you both for the introductions and the context, and and, uh, and I think this was really really put it to put the, the questions out there. And I think, in a way, I think Uganda was the country that we struggled for the longest with which one to choose, uh, because uh, because Uganda is clearly the least fragile of the countries, and we could have chosen other. African countries in the place, and I think uh, so. So, 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 in a way, there are good reasons, as uh, as Ellen was mentioning, for choosing uh, choosing Uganda. It's a country that has that has both a high number of women judges, but also a, con a context that has, although it is a very limited the civil war in terms of the in terms of the region, it has this this history. But it is also interesting because it has a history of women empowerment that is sort of a high on the political agenda in Uganda and has been so since the since the military takeover of the, the Idi Amin regime and with the, with the libera the uh, with the liberation movement that Museveni, who is still the president, was central in to power. So in the 95 constitution there is a strong commitment to gender equality and empowerment of women. So that was actually one of the reasons why Uganda is, is, an, interesting, is an interesting case. And Uganda has a history of quotas. We were discussing quotas on, on Monday. <laughs> and there are quotas for political office in Uganda. There are, there are no quotas for judicial office in Uganda. But, but interestingly, there are a lot higher share of women in judicial office than in political office even after three decades of quotas. So in political office, there are around 30% of parliamentarians, cabinet ministers who are, uh, who are um, women, including we've had women speakers of parliament. So there are sort of quite central uh, women in political office, but it's around sort of 30, 34%. In judicial office, there are 45% of judges who are women, slightly more in the lower courts, 47%, but there are 39% of women judges in the higher courts, which is relatively high uh, for any, any part of the world. So, so that was interesting. So it is an interesting uh, country in that sense. So why, so why did that happen? So, so, it's, <laughs> so Uganda, like many countries, are a mix of sort of, in terms of recruitment, formality and informality. So there is quite a meritocratic recruitment on one level. So, so of, of women, which no of judges, which makes it easier. We know that that meritocratic recruitment makes it easier for women to get onto the bench. And there has been a tradition of quotas in law schools. So the pool of women entering the legal profession have been relatively good. But also there is um, also in Uganda, and that's important to uh, we don't haven't quite figured out how it affects women judges. But there is a but the political loyalty is very important for being a judge in in Uganda, and that is increasingly important. So so there is a I mean it doesn't mean that you have to be sort of close to the party to be a judge, but it's difficult to be, be a judge if you're seen to be sort of unreliable politically. Uh, and I think that is uh, that's something that many of our, our the women judges that we worked with were sort of mentioning as an that as a as a, as a problem not only for women but for judges more generally and then the sort of level of political influence on on the on the judiciary that that is increasing. There are um, there are also I mean I think in terms of recruitment of women. There are, I mean, there has been women, there has been increasing. It's been very difficult to get reliable statistics on the historical statistics on women judges on the bench, but it has been grad gradually increasing since, since uh, the, uh, after the sort of, say in the 90s and uh, 1990s and, and beyond. But, but it's, uh, but I think that the fact that there are also women organizations in civil society uh, that are there is a women judges association that is quite active. There are organisations in 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 civil society that are also important for 
for uh, encouraging and also promoting women to the legal profession and to the judiciary. Good. Thank you so much. So let's stay in Africa for a while. <laughs> and Ellen, you could tell us the story of Angola, which of course has, as you mentioned, a different history, legal history, because you have the Portuguese influence uh, there as Angola was a Portuguese colony. Yeah. I just heard a lot of trigger words from Siri that I have to remember to mention, like political loyalty. Uh, but let me start with the history, just very, very briefly. Uh, independence came from Portugal in 1974, uh, after which, during which there were three sort of political factions fighting against, unanimously against the Portuguese. The Portuguese left the country and uh, there was a civil war. And that civil war lasted uh, about 20 years. There were various peace agreements where the United Nations was involved and the final agreement came in 2002. Uh, after the opposition leader was killed in an ambush. Uh, so the president of the country, uh, Dos Santos, he sat for 38 years. So basically he introduced a one party state uh, under MPLA, the, the main political party. The president was in power for 38 years, a step down only in 2017 or 18 and gave over the throne to another MPLA president. Um, so basically, there has been one political party in power since during the independence war, but also after independence. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying this because it is extremely important uh, for understanding access to the courts for women. OK, so what happened to the courts in this period? Um, during the war of independence, the former courts really didn't, didn't function much. So the, the dispute resolution conflict was solved basically in traditional courts. Almost all of the judges who were basically educated in Portugal left the country. So when, when independence was over, I think there was literally a handful of educated judges. Um, now that handful in the course of the 90s, the 2000s, what 20 something years has just exploded. So we've gone from one female judge and a handful of judges to about 700 judges at the at now. And I think this is important also <laughs> mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. explaining the recruitment of women judges because the number of vacancies in the courts has just been enormous. Um, I just want to mention that the first, you asked about the first female judge, mm -hmm. right? The first female judge in Angola was actually appointed to the court in 1950 all the way back when. Uh, and she was a human rights activist. Uh, let me let, read her name, because she is historic, Maria do Carmo Medina, uh, who was educated in Portugal and moved to Angola and was recruited into the judicial system and became uh, the only female on the first Supreme Court uh, in 1990. And that's, that's kind of uh, interesting. Uh, since then, the number of women has exploded, like I said, and the number of uh, women on the two apex courts uh, in Angola now has been lying around 40, sometimes surpassing 40%. Um, and it's also around 40% for the entire judicial system. Uh, the number of courts has, uh, in the constitution, it was kind of stated that um, when the courts became independent from the political party, they were not always. They were co-opted by the party for many, many, many years. With the new constitution in 2000, um, there was a declaration that the judiciary would be independent. Um, and the constitution for so, um, stated that they would have about 187 municipal courts and then provincial courts in 20 provinces and then two apex courts, uh, the Supreme Court and the Constitutional Court. The Supreme Court started working in 1990 and the Constitutional Court was only established in 2008. So it's very, very recent. And the Constitutional Court started off with gender parity basically when it was established, mm. which is interesting, mm. but it was mm. in a different mm. era, right? It wasn't in the 50s, it wasn't the mm. way into the 2000s. So I think we can also talk about international factors and the frameworks mm. influencing how women get yeah. onto the bench. But I think for Angola, um, Entry to the lower bench uh, was long um, colored or influenced by party loyalty. Um, there was 
no judicial, there was no law faculty in Angola. This is another thing. There was no law faculty at the end of independence. So the first law faculty was established at the only university uh, soon after. And then now there are 10 law faculties. So in the beginning, mm. those who were educated had to go either to Portugal mm. or to Brazil mm. for their education. So the first female judges in Angola actually received their education outside Angola. And these are the forceful women who are now mm. serving on the Supreme Court and uh, on, the, um, on the Constitutional Court. But access to the bench, lower, lower bench, uh, that was colored by, uh, by party loyalty for very many years. Uh, and then a formal training school for judges was established only a couple of, just mm. a few years ago. And after that, it has become merit-based and women have excelled. Mm. Women have, are now about two thirds of the students in the, the, the judge training school um, and they come out tops in the exams. So we heard from one of our, our informants that uh, she started off with 40, 120 people uh, in her cohort uh, and only 40 of those graduated and only two of those who graduated were men. So 38 women graduated, only two men graduated. This is just like three years ago. So the women, the pool of eligible women uh, for judgeship at the lower level is enormous. It has just exploded. Mm. Uh, at the higher level, um, it's, uh, let me just say that Angola doesn't have this climbing system where you start at the lower court and then you're sort of aspiring to higher judicial office. Uh, recruitment at the two, on the two apex courts is done directly mm. and it's done basically by the president, mm. okay? So the president appoints all the judges on the Supreme mm. Court. The president appoints most of the judges on the Constitutional Court. Four of them are politically appointed by the National Assembly, which is MPLA dominated, and there was one by public tender. So the only woman we spoke to um, who didn't have an MPLA background was elected by UNITA. Mm -hmm. from the national parliament. This basically means that the president is free to appoint the people he likes. Yeah. They're all party loyalists. Uh, the women, or not the women, the men and the women serving on the two APEC courts are not allowed to be part, have party affiliation. They're not allowed to be party members of a party, but they're still loyal to a party. <laughs> so I think party loyalty, you can't explain access of women uh, to the courts in Angola without taking party loyalty into account. Um, they've had a gender-friendly president, right? The president has been more concerned with party loyalty than with gender. So it hasn't really mattered whether it's been a man or a woman as long as they're loyal to the, to the party. Mm -hmm. So you haven't found the traditional obstacles to access, uh, but the obstacle, if you mm -hmm. want, has been party loyalty, going back to Uganda. Yeah. I think we find a lot of parallels there mm -hmm. to who gets mm -hmm. on the court and who doesn't, especially the high courts. Yeah, interesting. So... Um... Uh, there are some similarities uh, to other African countries um, that uh, at uh, Independence Day, they had no um, law schools uh, set up in their countries, or it was law schools um, by the dominating uh, force. And uh, so um, they had to go abroad to study law, and that was a um, hurdle for women because mm -hmm. that cost money. And money was easier spent on young men than on uh, women. This is what I learned from other African reports. Yeah. And um, uh, so <laughs> that women are top in examinations is different in countries. In Germany, women fare less good in the first legal examination <laughs> than um, uh, young men, which is a really worrying uh, factor. And uh, you've also mentioned the influence of the donor countries, which is very important. The donor countries uh, now push the countries to, yeah, right. And so we move on. No, I was right. saying particularly in Haiti. Yes. That's yeah. why I was. But not, not in Angola. No. The donors, this is no. an oil rich country. Yeah. So yes. they have plenty of money and yes. they don't really care what they're going to say. Yes, but, but in Haiti, Egypt, Egypt, Egypt is an example yeah. Yeah. where uh, foreign money has forced the Egyptians to mm -hmm. uh, nominate women as mm -hmm. judges. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Haiti, Haiti. Mariana. <laughs> yeah, uh, Haiti has a very different colonial history from, from the other countries because uh, Haiti got independence from France in 1804. 
so it was the first black republic uh, and it, <laughs> independence was a result of a slave rebellion that went really well and they actually beat Napoleon later on. So they're very proud of this heritage. So the French have, have been um, uh, ruling Haiti since 1804. Um, and also the conflict history in Haiti is also quite different from, from um, Uganda and Angola because there haven't been like a full-blown civil war. It's never been that, but still the road um, towards democracy has been very, very violent and very difficult. So there was a um, dictatorship from the 50s to the 80s under, under the Duvalier, the Papa Doc and Baby Doc, as mm -hmm. we maybe know them as. Um, and then there was like some democratic openings in the in the 1990s, but then the military came in and uh, ruled for three years. Um, so like from the 1990s until today, uh, there's been a very like yeah painful road towards democracy, and democracy remains very very fragile as the rest of the state. Uh, Haiti is now considered the 13th most fragile state in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the first woman judge, uh, Ursa Pascal Trouillot, she entered the courts um, in Port-au-Prince in 1975. And she also later became the first female president of Haiti, although it was an interim president, so it didn't, she wasn't elected or anything. Um, and, but the, the level of women judges remains very, very low until the, like we're talking about like 2% uh, until the 1990s. And that's when uh, the donor community uh, came in and started supporting judicial reforms as a way towards democratization. So the judiciary was completely uh, destroyed from years of dictatorship. Uh, the judiciary was very, very weak. Um, so they started a lot of judicial reforms in order to try to make the judiciary much more professional, much more and much more independent from the and not no longer just an extension of the executive. So one of the of the things that they implemented was uh, new recruitment procedures to the judiciary. Earlier, um, recruitment had been um, uh, direct direct appointments, which we know uh, often. Uh, uh, disfavor women and uh, because they are not part of these male elite networks that gives you access to these uh, positions. Uh, but in the 1990s, uh, they introduced uh, a magistrate school or a judge, judicial school. Um, and to become a judge there, you had to just take an exam and um, then you automatically got a post. So it was based on merit, whatever merit is, but it's still like mm -hmm. uh, um, examination results, basically, mm -hmm. academic qualifications rather than political contacts. So um, there's been an increase of women judges in Haiti from 2% in the 1990s to 12% today. And you might think 12% is not a lot at all. It's among the lowest uh, percentages, uh, at least in our selection. But if you compare this to the number of women in other decision-making roles in Haiti, it's, it's quite good actually, because in parliament, there's only 3% women. So they are doing quite, they are, they're finding some, at least some representation in the, in the judicial system. Uh, yeah, so I, I see the increase of women judges as a result of state building, uh, which did not intend, um, the intention was not to get more women judges, but it was more like a byproduct of building the judicial system and making it more independent and professional. Um, and you find women judges in Haiti on all uh, levels of uh, all, all court levels, but you actually find uh, less women on the lowest court level among the justices of the peace. And you also just find one woman uh, at the Supreme Court. So most women you find at the uh, intermediate. Yeah, intermediate, the, the appellate courts and the trial courts. Um, so that's quite interesting because in most countries in the world, you find the low, even in countries where you have a lot of women judges, you find most of them at the lower levels of court, but that's not the case in Haiti. And that's probably because these lower courts are also found in rural areas and women often tend to go for them more urban areas. Yeah, interesting. Um, we have the situation that in some countries, <laughs> women are sent to the rural areas mm -hmm. deliberately, which uh, puts an enormous strain on them. If they live uh, in the big cities, they have to travel a lot. 
Um, and so now, Afghanistan. <laughs> Turun, <laughs> what about Afghanistan? Um, yes. Um, well, Afghanistan, um, it, its history, um, there is a long continuity, I would say, in certain ways um, about how the legal system has evolved. Um, I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, but there's also, of course, a lot of rupture. Uh, there's been five constitutions just since 1977, and we're definitely looking at another one now, I think. Mm. Um, Afghanistan was never a formal colony, although um, the influence of, of the foreign powers have been monumental uh, at different parts of its history. Russia, um, the British, the American, uh, just to mention perhaps the most important ones. Um, so um, the, the history of, of, of usury um, is, is very long in the sense that um, Afghanistan has, um, I would say millenniums, uh, or perhaps not millenniums, um, yeah, one millennium at least, um, a, a tradition of, of Islamic learning in their country and uh, judges have uh, emerged from this tradition. Um, and then they've been gradually um, uh, kind of, uh, some would say, co-opted by the state. So in the 1880s, you had a, um, uh, a ruler who tried to incorporate these judges where we're kind of operating independently uh, into the state structure and tried to make sure that there were certain um, standards and certain procedures and that judge could not, judges could not just educate independently. So it's a gradual history of, of um, taking these Islamically trained um, uh, judges and make them state employees. Um, and then from the 1930s onwards, you had a gradual secularization of the judiciary and the legal framework, but with kind of um, uh, different uh, ruptures. Um, and you had um, a the establishment of sec secular legal education. Um, at the universities, but still um, majority of judges coming from these um, madrasas, uh, centers of, of Islamic training, um, outside of kind of direct government uh, regulations, some of them. Um, and then um, you had uh, the first uh, female judge was appointed in 1969, um, which is historically quite early uh, when you compare to other countries um, with the same background, like. Iran had a uh, female judge in 1976, Egypt apparently only in 2003. So it's still quite early. And um, then you had um, small, uh, I mean, women mostly came then from university background and there were very few women at the universities, um, but you had this small and steady increase uh, in the 1980s when there was communist rule. And then when the Mujahideen took power or tried to take power, um, but there was mostly a civil war in the 1992 to 1994, then a lot of female judges left. Um, you know, many become refugees uh, from different regimes, but also um, many just weren't, didn't feel the conditions were okay to, to serve with the civil war and Mujahideen's um, hostility, I would say, to, to, to um, educated women. And then of course, Taliban took over in 1996. Uh, no female judges were allowed to work, as were no other female professionals, apart from some in the health sector. Um, although I do hear that informally the Taliban would actually um, hire some women to assist with interviewing um, female detainees and things like that. Uh, but that's not, uh, that was never kind of a formal policy. Um, and then after 2001, you had a, a major rupture again. Um, with um, Taliban the, being um, um, uh, kicked out of power or removed. And um, you had um, uh, kind of uh, the victors of the war then came together in an extremely fragmented way. Um, different factions, uh, posts were allocated um, according to concerns of politics, kind of what they then call the big 10 politics. politics. But um, the Supreme Court, which appoints judges, um, where it kind of um, formally the domain of quite a uh, conservative actors, um, Islamists with Islamist orientations. It meant that the judiciary was, was, uh, has been a kind of bastion, I mean, some continuity with Taliban and uh, it's, it's considered quite a conservative actor. Uh, it's considered um, 
uh, also um, very factionalized and and a lot of uh, appointments are made on considerations of political loyalty but it's it's not as it's not one it's not about ideology mm. and the strong ruler it's more about these different factions uh, mm. that together have made up the first 2001 state mm. where we call them uh, tanzims or party networks um, with certain ethnic um, kind of bases as well um, Afghanistan actually has a mixture of civil law and, and Sharia law. Uh, so it means that um, they have a competitive entry for uh, judges. Um, in um, 2001 or shortly after, I think 2004, when they start producing statistics, only uh, 3% of the judges were female. Now it's around 11%. Um, it's quite challenging um, to get a lot of information out of the judiciary. Mm -hmm. It's a very secretive organization and they don't, um, seem um, they're not very keen on the idea of research um, and um, so uh, it's also an institution that hasn't really been the focus of a lot of research um, so we don't have as, as per today we don't have a complete oversight of the exact posting of all female judges but it's clear that many of them are posted in um, in the lower courts uh, in family courts and courts that are considered um, suitable for women um, so, um, so yeah, the, they have the, the competitive entry exam means that in formal terms, the, the uh, judiciary is quite accessible to women. Um, although uh, the percentage of women serving as judges now is 11%, um, the number of female uh, uh, students who are in the stash course are higher at around 20%, which is roughly the same portion that female university students as a whole. Mm -hmm. Um, but then once they do get their certificates uh, and are qualified as judges, um, there is a lot of obstacle to female judges. Um, the one very important one is uh, the kind of rural dimension that you mentioned. Um, Afghanistan, um, I don't know, I feel like I should be speaking in past tense a lot about these things, but <laughs> I still haven't got <laughs> acclimatized to that, so I'll speak in present tense. Um, Afghanistan has 34 provinces. Um, and um, of course, uh, as the post-2001 insurgency gained hold, these are becoming more and more insecure, um, both for men and women, I would say. Um, and judges have been assassinated. They've been a, 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 a considered target for insurgents. So probably talking um, at least 100 judges being killed uh, mm -hmm. by insurgents. Uh, and perhaps in certain uh, occasions, there might be some local rivalry as well. Um, but it's very difficult. Uh, it's been a very, very dangerous profession. Um, but there seems to be a much higher tolerance for men uh, to take this risk um, and be posted in this provincial um, and districts than for women. So I think it's a, it's a kind of mixture between actual security concern and certain gender dimensions. So men, um, you know, they often, when they're posted in, we're posted in these provinces, um, they would typically not take their family, but commute, you know, to the capital or to the city where they had their family on a weekly basis. Um, and that would not be considered acceptable for women to, to live on their own in this compound, uh, you know, for a week and then without family. Um, and of course, a lot of women don't want to, to leave their children behind. Um, and it's considered uh, inappropriate. Um, and also, I think um, there is this, my, you know, men are the main providers, typically the main providers, so men must take high risks. Women's job is often seen as optional. Uh, so there isn't, a, it's just, you know, the same family support for women to take up these positions, but then the Supreme Court to make the appointments uh, will often not um, consider this. So they will just appoint women to these provinces where they cannot take the positions and then mm. they, they, cannot, um, uh, they cannot do their job and, that might sometimes get these temporary positions in Kabul, but a lot of women um, then cannot actually practice. Okay, so we've learned a lot now about uh, the political situation in the countries, about uh, the legal and uh, judicial system, and the situation of uh, women in the countries. Um, so you have not only given details about access, but also some information about the careers. and. Which, is, which can almost be generalized is um, that we have the courts of first instance and appeal courts and that the story of 
the Supreme Court and constitutional courts is different. Also in Germany, mm -hmm. there's a political factor in uh, nominating uh, women to these courts, but we can pride ourselves that we have 16 constitutional court judges and out of them, um, nine uh, are women, <laughs> meanwhile, so they mm -hmm. also, uh, number men. Um, the question is, um, is there a kind of um, horizontal stratification? This is something I, I learned from you, that that is marked in Afghanistan. Uh, could you say briefly a little word about it? And then also mm -hmm. to hear whether that is the case in other countries. In Germany, I couldn't discover any effect in that sense. Sorry, do you mean where women are located? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. In yeah. which um, parts of the judiciary, uh, what they are specialized in, mm -hmm. and where. It's, it's always uh, very often a push and pull factor. Do women want to be in special fields or are they pushed into special fields? Mm. Yes, I mean, that is a, it's a very important question, and I don't think in Afghanistan it can answer it definitely either way. There is certainly a disproportionate number of women who are in, in family courts um, and in juvenile courts and in the newly established courts to, to hear cases of violence against women. Um, the idea of having women in these courts seems to be twofold. Um, one is um, something that's certainly been pushed um, by women activists is the idea that um, it's good for women uh, litigants to have female judges um, that's uh, in family courts where are where there are more women um, having cases, cases to do with divorce, marriage, custody, and so on. Mm. Uh, it's, it's considered that women will be more empathetic, female judges will be more empathetic, but perhaps more importantly, women will feel more at ease to talk to them about private things. Um, you know, there's still, obviously, it's a very gender-segregated society. Women might be feel, you know, even com uncomfortable talking to a male stranger, not to mention talking about private things. So it's considered a good thing in that way. But at the same time, I think there is a whole notion of, uh, of uh, priority and, um, and gender segregation. So when the family courts were first established as separate courts from the other civil courts, um, it was the idea that women shouldn't go to the main courts where they're often located next to the governor's office and to intelligence offices and all this thing is considered not a good place for women. Mm -hmm. So there is this idea, I think, that women should meet other women in the female and in the family courts. And um, that kind of uh, reinforces, I think, two things. Firstly, the gender segregation of, of Afghan society. And secondly, the idea that female judges aren't real judges. They're there just kind of to take care of these, these necessary things, these women issues. Um, so and all the judges we spoke to, um, the female judges we spoke to, says that, that these are not these are the least prestigious courts. Criminal courts is considered more prestigious. Uh, other specialized courts um, dealing with heavy crimes and corruption and, and things like that. And of course, the Supreme Court, um, where there are um, uh, nine, um, seven, uh, nine, seven, eight, um, nine uh, members of the Supreme Court, and none of them are women. And um, this, uh, uh, the, the recent president until last week, uh, Ashraf Ghani, made this as a campaign promise to nominate one woman, uh, Anisa Rasoli. She was nominated. Uh, she did not get uh, enough votes in parliament. Um, and there was a debate about whether a lot of Male par parliamentarians said a woman cannot hold such a high position, you know, the things you were saying about irrationality, um, and also that it's not uh, in Islam for a woman to have this position because she would be ruling in terms of um, all these um, educate, um, uh, execution things, which a woman has do not have the, uh, the kind of sense to do because she's, she's irrational. And, you know, even I think some people have mentioned that when she's in a period, she cannot be accounted upon to make wise decisions and, and things like that. Yeah, um, good. So <laughs> I wonder 
you know, whether we have any, anything remarkable about that in other countries, but uh, you could also answer it in the context of what are career obstacles uh, to women. Because of course, if you have women's corners and male turfs, how I call it, uh, then the women compete with each other <laughs> and don't move up. Uh, what is interesting to mention the context uh, you were dealing with is uh, that in other countries, the religious courts, uh, which mainly deal with family matters, are male courts. And so this is uh, really amazing about Afghanistan. Um, yeah, so you have talked about the careers, but what are the, the obstacles? Uh, any more about that, Marianne? You want to say something about it? Yes. And briefly, because we still have quite a lot to cover. Yes. <laughs> uh, so you mean like the, the experience of working as a judge? As yes, a yes, 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 yes. Yeah. For example, of course, uh, obstacle is always uh, combining family and work. Yeah. In Germany, uh, a really considerable number of judges work part-time, and mm. part-time is a career killer. Mm. Then you uh, don't move up. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, all the judges I spoke to, who were both men and, and women, complained about the huge workload and the lack of resources they had to work with in, in a context like Haiti, which is a very, very poor country, uh, and the judiciary is not really prioritized in the state budget. And some also claim that it is not in the interest of the, of the government to actually strengthen the judiciary because then they lose control <laughs> through corruption, etc. So a lot, uh, a lot of judges complain about um, not having the paper to call people into questioning, for instance, not having a phone, not having um, security, uh, especially on the lower uh, court levels, there were no security guards in courts, which made a lot of judges feel very unsafe, especially the women. Um, because you, if you had to protect yourself, you had to do it to yourself. So a lot of the male judges that talked to said that I don't go anywhere without my gun, but you wouldn't see a woman judge walk around with her gun in the same way. So that created these kind of gendered vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I, a lot of the women I talked to also talked uh, about how they had to work twice as hard as men just to be considered equal. Uh, because the judiciary is still a very male dominated uh, profession. It was considered a, as a profession for men. So, so, so many of the women judges talked about how they came, uh, they were the first person to arrive in the morning and the last person to arrive, to, to leave at night. Um, yeah, so, so I think that the most, like um, the clearest trend among my uh, informants were that um, judges are under extreme pressure from um, the government from not only from the executive but from deputies on both national and local level it was very very common that people get uh, got phone calls mm -hmm. like you have to do this for me you have to to make this case um, uh, go away or you have to um, uh, uh, yeah and that sometimes these kinds of pressures could be become violent mm -hmm. as well and uh, so a lot of judges had received death threats and there's also during the past years that there's, there's been several assassination and assassination attempts um that much so, about judicial, judicial independence <laughs> exactly so you cannot talk about judicial independence yeah. in haiti uh, working mm. under such conditions yeah, yeah. and you have the security situation that uh, works together with this lack of independence because you, you are not safe and you do not know who you're not safe from mm. because there's also a very close connection between politicians and gang leaders politicians have used gang leaders as a political tool to, to put pressure on other politicians and areas uh, there's areas of, of the capital where you cannot go because the gang leaders have taken completely over so so it's it's all of these pressures from different um levels and you do not you know if if a judge is attacked by uh, a gang leader, is it just a result of crime in this country, or is it someone who has uh, uh, is, is the, was, was it the henchman of some politician? Um, so this 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 is something that is a challenge for all judges, uh, both men and women. But the women have different. It's like the, yeah, the gendered vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. What you describe is something I've heard from uh, several Latin American uh, mm. countries. It mm. seems to be uh, something uh, which is happen which happens uh, in many countries there, and also particularly about the uh, workload. Mm. Uh, Leanne Junquera has uh, 
quite a long time ago, um, uh, coined the phrase that judges have to be asexual uh, beings uh, and uh, that they uh, suffer enormously under that workload and that it's very difficult for them to combine family and work. In Germany, the female judges say the judiciary is a, is a women's paradise because mm. we have a defined workload mm. and <laughs> gender equal pay and um, we have maternity leave and whatever or, mm. and a wonderful pension at the end. So, um, yeah, this is a very special story of Latin America, yeah, obviously. Yeah. Uh, so, Siri, um, what about um, the um, maybe horizontal yeah. stratification and mm. also career obstacles? Yeah. Uh, thank you. So, one of the biggest complaints that the judges we spoke to, the women judges we spoke to in, in Uganda, were was that so. There might be a lot of women in the judiciaries, but very few make it to the decision-making positions within the judiciaries. There has been women in the a large number for quite a while, but they don't really make it to the top. So that was a concern. So that is both uh, to the sort of very important decision-making positions in the lower judiciary, and I'll talk about that. There was a woman for a short while. Uh, there is, uh, but also to the um, heads of divisions of the high court, the different divisions of the high court, and also to uh, to the presidents of the of the the, the courts, and, and and also to the to the chief justice and deputy chief justice. So, and the, but they often make it to the deputy position. So there are a lot of women deputies, deputy uh, heads of division. Also, there has been a woman deputy. Uh, yeah, almost at all levels. So but the point is that they then get passed over when a new when a new head is being is being appointed, and this was so there was a lot of discussion about this sort of tokenism with, of of gender representation at the top levels of the judiciary. So that was uh, that was a major concern. Um, there was also this uh, that maybe it goes to effects, but there was also this um, there quite a bit of talk about uh, when there was a woman who was the chief magistrate, the head of the magistracy, the lower the lower bench. There, were, there came a lot of issues uh, to the um, table on sexual harassment within the lower within the, within the lower judiciary, and that this was something that was endemic in a way. It was sort of structural, and that that was quite important. Uh, they were arguing and for uh, in some cases at least for promotions and so on. So, so uh, and but then she stayed for a short while and then you came in and then it has been sluggish but this says that that made it sort of to to the table so there is clearly an element and it's also important that in in uganda judges come into the bench in various ways and, and both at the high court and at this uh, sort of um, appellate courts and, and supreme court they come in from a lot of them come from legal practice so they're advocates and they come in so they don't come up through the ranks and then some are academics and they're appointed in different ways and there is a, there is a formal process there is a judicial service commission interviewing and so on but in in actual fact on the higher courts the president is important to decide who in, in the end gets gets the position and but so it is sort of they're they're thoroughly vetted but who's in the end is selected my that also has political uh, aspect that said there is quite a lot of leeway once you're in the bench on the, on the bench of, of of acting in an independent manner it's not like it's 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 totally limited politically but but i think this is also important because some women come from prestigious positions outside the judiciary and they carry that prestige so if you came if you were a professor or sort of part of the university leadership and you come into the Supreme Court, that gives you a different position. Um, and and that, that makes a huge difference once you come to the bench. And there is clearly a class dimension. So many uh, of the judges come into the lower bench. They come from quite a variety of backgrounds, but the ones who make it further up would, many would argue, be more elite. Then you need networks and then you need to be more elite. Ellen, you a brief word also <laughs> brief word um, very, very, difficult. <laughs> very difficult very difficult but we still have let me just say that, uh, following up from afghanistan and haiti security issues for judges yeah. is not a case in mm -hmm. angola i think that's, that's very important true. to stress because this is an 
very well functioning in some ways authoritarian mm. or autocratic one party state. Yeah. Right. Thank and they don't. want the judges so they don't abuse the judges. And you don't have gangs, uh, <laughs> at least not that I know of, in the same way that you have cities divided into gangs in many countries in the world, including in Haiti. You don't find this in Angola. Um, in terms of distribution, uh, there are 20 provinces and almost all of the judges are concentrated in three provinces. So there are only, you know, the three provinces cover 90% of the judges, basically. So there are very few judges in many provinces, in very few judges at all. And there are some provinces without a single female judge. Um, so this is just to say that it's very heavily concentrated in the capital. Uh, in terms of horizontal distribution, um, I don't think we saw any systematic patterns, uh, but we did speak to people in the family court, uh, which is like at the appellate court level, provincial court in, uh, in Luanda, and there were four female judges and one male judge. They said they wanted to work, or they all said they wanted to work in the family court because they were very engaged with uh, issues of poverty and the family, and especially concerned with children. Mm -hmm. Um, and this male, one male judge said something interesting. He said, as always, also, you know, what, what is it like to be the single male on an all, in an all-female court? And he said, the most important thing is sensitiveness, sensibilidad, also to it's be sensitive. sensitive. And, and he said, this does not have to do with gender. You can be a man and be sensitive, and you can be a woman and be sensitive. So for him, it had to do with you know personal capacities more than with gender. And then I think that was an interesting observation. Um, we had women judges saying that they were more afraid working in Luanda than working in the provinces. Uh, people were assigned to the provinces. When they finished their judicial exams at the judicial school, it was the National Supreme Council um, who decided where they would be placed. So those were the highest grades could pick where they wanted to go. The other ones were sent. Most of the women who were sent out into the field said that they had to have the support of their husbands to do this. Some of them were the only women with children when they were stuck way up north in a very remote court, even without court buildings at this point. Uh, so they, you know, they would do the judgeship from uh, the schoolhouse. Uh, so the support of male partners uh, was considered central by almost everybody. Some of them also mentioned support of their fathers and inspiration by their mothers. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the, none of them really mentioned obstacles so much, uh, except for resources was a big thing, lack of resources, anything from ink to paper, uh, transportation for witnesses, um, but, so lack of resources, at some point, uh, judges didn't receive their pay because there wasn't, you know, pay payment stopped for like three months. This is a few years ago. Uh, so it was hard to do their work, but they still continued. Um, and what else? I think those are the main points. And I know we're running yeah, out yeah, of time. Yeah, yeah. Because stop. I want to move on, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you mentioned the sensitivity, and that takes us to the also quite big issue, but we have to be brief on it. And I think we agree to be brief on it. Um, do women in the judiciary make a difference? Or is it just that men and women need sensitivity uh, to do a good uh, judicial work? When we started our project on um, uh, gender and judging, well, it goes back to the 80s. That was the time of difference feminism. And so we wondered, do women change the judiciary or the legal profession altogether? Or does the legal profession uh, change women? And we were very much influenced by Carol Gilligan and her work and tried to find out, is there a female substance? Because in the 80s, difference feminism circled around uh, the idea uh, that women may be uh, better persons than men, men having brought all the wars over um, the world and women being more peaceful. Well, this was not my point. My point was just trying to find out, is there something? And I always said, I went around like someone catching butterflies to see, is there some evidence uh, for difference? And um, uh, well, I have quite a lot in mind, but I want to ask you if you have perceived anything of that, do women change the, the judiciary? It can be the image of the judiciary, what the judiciary looks like. I have a very <laughs> clear opinion about it as I go to the law courts very often. Um, and do they judge differently? Do they produce 
different results? Are they less objective than um, what men feared historically? Sorry. <laughs> So it's a big question. Yeah. And of course, we haven't did this project. Try to be brief. So this is, a, this is a very qualitative project. Yes. So we don't look quantitatively at yes. how. Yes, yes, but yes. I know that, I mean, uh, projects that do find that in terms of judgments, it's difficult to see, Clara. It's sort of quantitatively clear, clear uh, differences. So when we asked um, about this, uh, the, um, the both women and men, male judges, they would say that it would make a difference maybe the biggest difference in, in terms of um, procedure, that many men, women, particularly working at the lower courts uh, out in the, in, in the rural areas and so on, said that they would may, try to make the courts physically and in terms of process more accessible to women and more fr friendly to women who had to bring their children, for instance, but that it, they, they wouldn't have to be outside for a long time. In the, in the, so, so both physically, but also in terms of procedure. They, they, they said they felt that, it, that the, the women, again, not all women, and not only women, but, but sort of, uh, sort of as, a, as a general, uh, more, more approachable, and more, and also in terms of the image that women judges would make it in some cases easier for women to come with their complaints. So that was that was one of the things that 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 uh, maybe was the clearest. And then they said that on certain issues relating to maybe sexual and reproductive rights yeah. more generally, that that not all women again, and not only women, but but that women would be more understanding of uh, of women's perspectives in these in these cases. But uh, yeah, so yeah, I that think. catches a lot of uh, what we found out. And uh, women are very important in the communication structure. Mm. Uh, I've, uh, there's some empirical work about it, and that is what I observe in law courts too. Marianne, what have you found out about it? Yeah, uh, I, I talked Briefly. a lot about. It. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, <know. laughs> so I had, a, I had a, since I had more. This is my PhD project, so I had more time devoted to, to, to field work. So I, I got a chance to talk a lot of both men and women, and I was interested in knowing how they reflected around gender yes. issues. And uh, of course, SGBV came up uh, immediately because that has a very high focus in in mm -hmm. Haiti. And there seems to be this uh, perception that women judges are more uh, better equipped. To, to treat these kinds of cases because so they, social and gender based violence. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. Sorry, taking gender based violence because they have lived as a woman in Haiti and they have maybe encountered such mm. situations themselves. And there was also some uh, who, who thought that this was just innate qualities, like women are more. <laughs> Yeah, mm. <laughs> sensitive <laughs> by nature. Um, but I, I do think that that training might be a, a very important yes. component here because I talked to a lot of male judges who were also very gender conscious and could know a lot about um, victim support and how to interview someone mm. who had experienced a rape. Uh, and, and those had received quite a lot of training on these issues, uh, which again, here comes the donor community who has uh, focused a lot about training uh, judges on these issues. And they even have a, a course in the magistrate school um, <coughs> devoted to, to mm. gender-based violence. Now, this is interesting about the gender trainings. I've done gender trainings in Germany and the judges have hated it. I've said it's ideological re-education. <laughs> and I tried to be very entertaining. That was the only way I could catch them. And the result was that we included uh, gender issues in whatever training we did, but we did not offer specific gender trainings mm. afterwards. So Turun, um, can you add a little bit briefly because we <laughs> Yes. Um, <laughs> Yes, uh, as others, um, we're not in a position to answer this question kind of um, and definitely um, within the scope of the project. But uh, I think one indirect relation here is the fact that the background of female judges are different than male judges mm. because women judges in Afghanistan tend to have a more liberal orientation, uh, more from the faculty of law rather than the faculty of Sharia, uh, typically from um, kind of liberal educated uh, families. Uh, so that I think has a has an impact on, on how they um, approach cases. Um, otherwise, the, the courts that I have observed but closely, um, there has been no difference in men and women. Women might have, um, uh, they might have um, not the energy or the, um, uh, um, the, the motivation to, to 
you know, you, in Afghanistan, you require a lot of, um, there's so many cases, there's cases overload. And if you really want to go into cases, that requires mm. a lot of energy and, and forcefulness um, mm. that some women might just not have. Uh, you know, and there's a lot of family pressure mm. and pressure for power holders. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have the right connections to withstand that pressure, uh, it's, it's very difficult to kind of take mm. a stand for, for women and some. Okay. So, Ellen. <laughs> the one minute thing on Angola. One minute. <laughs> um, <laughs> What people, both men and women, at the high apex court said in the Constitutional Court and, and the Supreme <laughs> Court was that having women uh, deliberating made it a better environment for communication. There, there were better true. deliberators. They, they were more sensitive to other opinions than the men. And th this they agreed on, actually. Um, in terms of the actual outcome of the case, everybody would say that that didn't matter. Gender didn't matter for the outcome. But we heard some anecdotal evidence that women, and I think this was at the lower court level, tended to be harsher uh, in cases of sexual violence, mm. particularly sexual violence committed against children. But this, we don't know this at the case level, but this was anecdotal evidence. Mm. This is what they said. Um, and then in terms of motivation for judgeship, uh, we found that, you know, just based on a very, very small sample uh, of judges, People working at the provincial and lower level seem to be more committed to being judges. Some of the judges we uh, talked to at the Supreme Court and at the Constitutional Court level said that they didn't really want to be there. They had, they had never aspired to become high court judges, uh, but they were asked by the president and they couldn't say no. Uh, and when we asked lower court judges if they aspired to become, you know, because these are positions of prestige and power, uh, the lower court judges would say, some said, yeah, one day they wanted to work for the Constitutional Court because they really wanted, they were very, you know, inspired and thought human rights, for instance, was very important. And other people said flatly, no. These are political courts. They would have nothing to do with them. They wanted to be judges and deal with violent matters. <laughs> Sorry. I just need to mention one more thing because it's a big, I mean, it's a big topic. So many of the people we talked to said women judges are less corrupt. The Judicial Service Commission said that they have very few cases against the corruption allegations against women judges compared to men. And this is, of course, a big issue. And we know any corruption is difficult to investigate. But I just wanted to say that, that, so I think that because it goes to your question. So I think, so we still, so less corrupt and more hardworking. So that's what many people say. Yeah, yeah. This was an outcome of all comparative mm. work to you. Um, it started that I read about women judges in Syria. And in Syria, many women judges were appointed mm. uh, to the administrative court because they were less corrupt. Men the breadwinner, women earning the additional mm. money for the family. And uh, I heard it about Bulgaria, many, many countries. Mm. But then we have a new project on women uh, judges in the uh, in East Asia and the, the Pacific in, mm. and in Sri Lanka it was reported that the women were as corrupt as the men. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, and they were clearly corrupt. It's always the question: How mm. do they uh, adapt uh, to the field, or uh, do they have their uh, special own? Yes, um, their, their, their special own. Um, well, their strategy: How uh, they, they want to work. Uh, just to mention. Of the differences is uh, there's empirical work on do women write judgments differently from men, mm -hmm. and there was some evidence that they write longer judges, more, more detailed, but you will always find uh, okay. examples uh, which will contradict. Mm, also, with uh, the what you mentioned, uh, Ellen, uh, that in uh, cases of violence, women pass harsher sentences. We also have evidence for the opposite, that women uh, would fear that they, um, that everybody would say, ha ha, the women pass harsher sentences here, and uh, which would de delegitimize uh, their sentences. And in Germany, I found out in empirical work that overall, it seems that women pass um, milder sentences anyway. I have some empirical work, I can't go into details. Um, now in Canada, it was found out that in uh, the constitutional court, uh, women were the big dissenters, 
but mm -hmm. only as long as uh, special issues for women still had to be dis uh, to be solved uh, in the law. So many other things, but now we have to turn to our audience and do you have questions? What do we want, would you like to comment or ask us? And if you don't have comments or questions, we have a lot to go on. <laughs> <laughs> but it would be so nice if you couldn't come in. <laughs> Anybody from the, um, uh, any questions from uh, the virtual audience? No. We yeah. Have a comment from okay. uh, Namja. Hmm. Comment? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. let me see. So. Hi all, I'm Nanga at Catholic University in Angola. Ah, okay. She's our co-author. Ah, okay, your co-author. I'm part of the group, yes. So just to emphasize what Alan and Sin were saying, uh, and Siri, Siri, of course, <laughs> were saying about the political loyalty to say that in the Angola context, this system of access has been able to promote inclusivity, but in many level it makes to question of inclusivity of women means or guarantees democratic access for all other women aha so women play. Hmm? yes yes then from margaret nanga kobe from oh i have to go in. otherwise i can't same. read it's it. just okay mm -hmm. i wonder what that everyone but i think it's better to read it out um or at least discuss inclusivity and representativeness in a social perspective and again, Margaret is writing, congratulations, colleagues. Oh, that's nice. Of course, it was a very interesting discussion. discussion. Love to see you again. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> any other question at this point? No, but I mean, she, she has no. a point. And yeah. That, that yeah. is yes. to say that 40% uh, of Angolans live below the poverty level. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. education is still not accessible to many girls mm. and boys, actually. Yes. Yes. And there is still a lot of partner violence. Uh, I mean, women <laughs> are still poor and many work on the streets. So it's not like because there are lots of women in the yeah. judiciary, violence goes away or poverty goes away. And mm -hmm. I think this is one of the things that Nanga wants to get to, mm -hmm. okay. is that, of course, it is very often the, the higher classes, the people with education, good family backgrounds, who actually make it. Mm -hmm. Although many more people have been making it to law school lately. I'm into politics, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, but it's, a, it's an important point. Uh, women judges do not necessarily re reflect the conditions of the whole population. Yeah, indeed. And also from other countries, of course, we know yeah. what you mentioned, that women has, have another social background than men. Even in Germany, women come from higher social strata uh, than men. Still, still, it was uh, in former times understandable when only few women uh, studied law, but we still uh, have this uh, effect. Um, of course, yeah, and we, of course, we have to see the situation in which uh, women work in some countries. There's a film about women judges in, um, not, not Nigeria, Ghana. Cameroon, Ghana. Cameroon, Cameroon, Cameroon. 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 And if you yeah, see how they well. practice, mm. how well they are in circuit. Yeah. Uh, mm. Cameroon has French law mm. and um, British law and common law. Um, but but what is about the common law part and how they go from village to village and do really grassroots practice of law, but in the gown and yeah. with the wig. Yeah. <laughs> That's very interesting to, to see. Yeah. And there you can see that they show a lot of empathy and uh, try to deal with the women's issues. Mm -hmm. I think I interrupted. Can I, there's oh. a question, another question there. From, From Pilar. Pilar. Yeah. Oh, Pilar, nice to hear you. Yeah. It is useful to distinguish between political loyalties and political preferences um, in high court roads. The point made by Siri that women appointed who bring professional prestige can be perhaps more assertive in terms of political independence is important. I, I think you have to explain that. <laughs> no, so, so um, I think there are many uh, aspects to this. And I think that there is this complex interplay. So I think all countries have this, uh, there is a degree of judicial independence in a way. So there are some red lines beyond which you can't go. There are some cases that are too difficult. And I think that a country like, like Uganda, when it comes to appointment of judges, and frankly, probably all kinds of appointments, and not least to the higher benches, there are these like outer limits. There, there has to be, I mean, there are some political considerations that, that, that sort of form, 
form the, the outer side of the spectrum. And within that, a lot of other issues are important, like, like uh, merit and, and what you've done in different fields, whether it is uh, grades or, or your previous accomplishments. But the more you have a different, the, the, and then there are different resources that can sort of, that you can draw on to build your position in independence. And that can be sort of your prestige from the where you came from. It can also be your family background and connections, your class background, but there are, and your networks, but there are some people who have more of an independent basis for, for independence. Yeah. But there are also people who just are very brave and who are sort of able to, to sort of make it. And it's, it's quite fascinating to see that some of the, so we, some of the women judges come from really humble backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And I would see in many of these countries, and that is a bit unfortunate, that the education system was more equal earlier than now. Yeah. It is much more stratified, much yeah. more private schools yeah. and much more in equal society. So quite a few of the judges who came up earlier, who are like our age, they would be more selected from a wide variety of backgrounds. And I think that is, is a concern in many countries. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. Stratification is kind of yeah. everywhere. Um, so we've read, risen very many important points. There are many more we could discuss about. We have three minutes left. So <laughs> each of you could say one sentence what this project has meant to you, uh, why it is important to you, and then I take the right for last sentence. So, Mariana, I should think you should start. <laughs> <laughs> this project uh, has uh, is my life. <laughs> 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 no, but it's, it's, it's my PhD. Uh, I, I, um, we talked about how, how do we like uh, select our cases, and I have to admit that I didn't select my case. I just came onto the project after it was selected. Uh, but uh, I have really enjoyed uh, focusing on Haiti, getting to know the country. Uh, it's uh, a very challenging environment to do field work in, but mm -hmm. still uh, I've learned a lot. And um, uh, yeah, and I, I think it's nice because my background is from women's representation in politics. So it, it has been interesting to, to see how these, uh, yeah, uh, what this kind of literature can say about the judiciary and like try to compare the different, um, okay. yeah, careers. Um, uh, yes, um, I mean, for me, this has been a smaller project um, within a portfolio of many projects on, African women and the justice system and um, kind of um, women's movements, uh, politics in Afghanistan. Um, but it, it made me realize how little I know <laughs> about and how little is written about this. Yeah. Um, and then also about the judiciary in itself and how it functions. So it motivated me to, to try to do more research on Good. this and support others. In this field. again shows the importance of work on women in the judiciary, the judiciary on the whole, but particularly on women, because there you combine uh, the work on the situation of women in the countries and uh, women in the judiciary. Siri. So I have done a lot of work in many, over many decades on, <laughs> on uh, judiciaries in, uh, and particularly in, in Africa, including in Uganda. But, but for me, I haven't done work particularly on women judges before, and it was very interesting. It gave me a different, a different perspective on the judiciary. So that was really, really good. And, uh, and also it's been a fun project, uh, learning across and a lot of good colleagues. So Brilliant. that's been nice. Ellen. I think I can just echo Siri, uh, because <laughs> this is the first project that I have actually worked on gender issues. Oh. Uh, I worked on courts also for yeah. about two, two and a half decades, probably, and human rights for a long time. But I haven't looked, thought about the gender issue uh, in the context of courts mm -hmm. before now, and that has been fascinating. So I think I've had probably had the, the sharpest learning curve of us all. Uh, and it has been wonderful, I think, to work with Marianna uh, as a PhD, who's been really mm. on top of the literature. Yeah and who is the person who has done the most in-depth field work with very nuanced findings and discussions. So that has been fantastic. And also this great group of people who are here, but also who are not here, <laughs> who are out in the virtual space. Yes. Or and many the, of them were online, actually. Some of them may be online, hopefully, yeah, okay. but also in other countries. It's, it's a pleasure to work with people from different backgrounds, with different interests, and with different empirical, as well as theoretical backgrounds and yeah. experiences, because they bring new things to the table. And when you sit down and discuss and mold out and, you know, ideas are sharpened and it makes you ask questions that you wouldn't do if you were sitting in your office and just reading on your own. So I think in that sense, it has been a, 
a yes. fun and useful project. Wonderful. And I think that the project will bring some important insights to the understanding of women judges and fragile contexts. And that yes. was our collective yes. ambition. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Well, as to me, when I was asked to do the gender and judging project, I didn't want to do it because a couple of years before I had edited a huge volume on um, women in the world's legal profession. Well, a man chose that title. I would have been more modest in <laughs> choosing the title. Uh, and uh, I thought you can only do once in your life a big comparative project. But then, okay, I was convinced. And uh, somehow that has become the hugest project, um, the gender judging project, the hugest I've been dealing with. Although I have done another big one on gender and careers in the legal academy and now in lawyers in 21st century societies. There are so many interesting things to uh, discuss and to deal with with the legal profession. So I can really recommend you uh, to follow in the field. But, let me end with a nasty and amusing story. When I did interviews in the law courts in Germany, I also asked them all, um, is, do judges make a difference? Do, female, do women judge differently? And they all say, no, 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 we are objective and neutral. And well, I got some responses, we will make the judiciary more colorful, which by the way is something I would underline or the, well, we have the societal change that men have stopped wearing dark suits and ties, et cetera, et cetera. And this is also to be observed in, in the judiciary, but the football fan told me, I think in football matters, I might decide differently from my female colleagues, et cetera, many stories. <laughs> and the most amusing story was for me when I went to the social court of appeal of my federal state, asked that question, and then all the judges I asked they said, well, we had one case, yes, that was when we had to decide should Viagra be paid by the sickness <laughs> insurance. <laughs> so <laughs> this was <much laughs> about the differences in judging. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, a snickery ground, and of course, if there are differences, they do not have to be related to a fe to femininity as such a, a female biology. There's much involved, like uh, uh, life experience, background, mm. and all we've mm -hmm. heard mm -hmm. here. So mm -hmm. we can mm -hmm. go and discuss, but we have the chance to go and discuss. Things. Very good. So thank you. thank you so very much to you and to all of you who have listened to us. Yes, thank you. No. <laughs>